Greetings and welcome. I'm really sorry about the delay. There was an application error, which means, um, who knows what that means? Who has an, any idea at all? Uh, greetings and welcome. My name is Jake Rayson. I am a forest gardener and a forest garden designer. And today I would like to talk to you about ground cover. As you can probably hear, and you can probably see, I am in the polytunnel with the windows closed because the water has been, well, there's a load of water. I think it's going to get windy later on as well. So I just wanted to kind of protect stuff in here. It's all damp enough. Um, so I will be venturing outside to show you ground cover, but I wanted to kind of keep warm, uh, dry as possible for as long as possible. Um, so, so today, uh, yeah, it's, I'm just, it's been, it's been, a bit crazy trying to sort out online learning for the kids has been a bit of a nightmare a quite a few hours spent so i'm sure people who uh who, who who are used to using computers which is pretty much everybody will know that the technology really is kind of problematic and it's the same with live streams and with with, with group chats and all the rest of it so en enough about that so what i wanted to do was to show the chat i'm going to be chatting as i'm going along so really sorry, I haven't, I haven't publicized this very much or promoted it. Um, and it's been quite a busy time as well. So what I have been working on, the project I've been doing in the past, um, <laughs> the past for the past couple of weeks, well, past few weeks, I've been working on an eco homes development. So last week's live stream was from the car park in the eco homes development which was, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's a really interesting experience to work on something of that scale, even though it's, it's, it's five, it's 10 properties, it's five buildings. Um, oh, crikey, hold on. And uh, 16, 16 dwellings. So it's, it's, it's a bit of scale involved in it. And, but it's, it's the real kind of basics that you notice more than anything else, you kind of, you notice the disconnect between different disciplines and different different uh, areas of expertise and also the basics that you have to get right. Now the problem that they've got, and this is kind of well known, the problem that they've got there is drainage. It's compacted clay, shale, subsoil, uh, and it's it's always been a marshy field apparently. And they, they need to sort the drainage out or you know that some you need to kind of work with that and that's a real kind of basic thing it doesn't matter what you do that's that is an issue that will always be there so one of the tenets of forest gardening is to do as little as possible really i must write a there's a fantastic uh, blog post called the Dow of web design when i was a web designer and it's about doing as least as possible working with what you've got and in that situation, and I will be showing you this later on, you've got to work with damp conditions, damp and wet conditions and working with them and then doing the least that you can to get around it. So that's the kind of that's the kind of basic the basic stuff. And this just applies to no matter the size of your garden, this applies to everybody. It's like what are the conditions have you got? What the things do you what things do you need to get right for things to flourish? In that situation, you need to get the drainage sorted out, and and it could be yeah, it could be a, it could be a range of range of things. It could be the soil, the drainage, the, not enough light coming in. Um, it could be a range of, range of different basic different things that you want your plants to grow and fl to flourish. What do you need for your plants to flourish? And no matter the size or scale of the project, it's the same stuff. Which brings me nicely on to the next point, uh, Abby Abby Sue. Um, in the on the forest garden group on the forest garden whatsapp group did say something kind of really interesting a couple of months ago about the scale of things and you know we're lucky well, i say lucky we are no we are lucky here we've got there's eight acres in total for the for, for, for our property but it's yeah it's a lot of work and it's a different it's a different scale and abby sue was saying that she's got a, a kind of a small garden and what difference does it make and i think it's in the grand scheme of things, everyone's on a small. In the grand scheme of things, everybody's on a small scale. Some some have a larger larger garden than other people, but every single garden ha is an opportunity for is an ecological opportunity. It's my little catchphrase. Every single garden is an ecological opportunity. No matter the size of your garden, you the things that you do make a difference. 
and this kind of applies to individuals as well your daily interactions how you behave how you treat other people and other things and in, in other and, and yourself makes a difference so don't think that it doesn't it really really does and those creatures that live in your garden will thank you for it you know you'll be surprised if you think of the the the, the kind of scale of uh, like in a handful of soil in a handful of soil there are um Oh, crikey, I can't remember the number for it. The number of microorganisms in that soil is absolutely vast. I think in a square metre of soil, it's something like there's more microorganisms than there are stars in the galaxy or something. It's a huge, huge number of living things that you are supporting. And I think it's that's once you, once you realise that, it might not, you know, on the face of it, you look at it, oh, well, that's not very interesting. Well, that's not very much. Actually, it is. It's a really, really big thing. And as part of that, going into the uh, segueing seamlessly into the next bit is about the ground cover. So for me, the main, the main, main aspect of forest gardening is working in layers. And it's this idea of, of, of having a different layers and keeping it really, really simple. The kind of basic principles, you have a ground cover, perm a permanent living ground cover. You never have bare soil in a forest garden. Apart, you know, apart from when you're harvesting something maybe, but it's always, a, there's a permanent living ground cover. And then you have herbaceous perennials, which can be part of the living ground cover and or, or other you know, plants coming up through the ground cover, shrubs, and then trees. And you have windbreaks as well to protect the garden. It's as simple as that. It's nothing, it isn't fancy. It isn't a, a kind of magic, <laughs> a magic idea about what your forest garden should look like. I had uh, an email from a woman called uh, Megan, Megan, I think, yeah, uh, in North America, near near the, to the west of New York, and she she was asking about the, the 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 principles and the ideas of forest gardening and whether they're applicable across the board, and they totally are. If you think of a forest garden as an edible ecosystem rather than trying to tie down the definition of a forest garden to like different layers and to specific plants then it's totally applicable across you know ac across a whole range of different uh different habitats and it really is that it's this it's the the pattern of it uh, if you're in a cool temperate climate like like, like we are here then the pattern is this is kind of the same you, you you're going to be growing trees the drier the climate then you know the, 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 the it's going to shift the balance is going to shift but the pattern is the same what you actually plant really depends upon what will grow there where you are your conditions what you want what resources you have and also what the native flora and fauna are so the, the what i always say with, the, with, with along with the forest garden because you're growing edible crops with nature you want to plant native plants where possible and as part of the email I wrote, I wrote i wrote an email yesterday as part of that email the whole idea is that you you bulk up the places that you want to introduce native plants are the places which aren't the direct edible crop so for example mineral accumulators um sorrel is yeah sorrel's a, a, a native broadleaf broadleaf sorrel is a is a uk native um there are a range of there's comfrey different types of comfrey actually there are uh, there are a couple two or three different species of comfrey are uk natives um but that's uh, mineral accumulators you can use those uh, licorice isn't but it's it's kind of mediterranean but you get the idea you use you use na uk native plants where you can windbreaks is the other is the other area and ground cover so it's, again coming back to the kind of the, the different layers of the different levels ground cover you can use uk natives because you're not really expecting to get a much of a, a harvest from it to be honest i looked i looked at growing strawberries like green strawberries and beach strawberries and i think i've eaten probably maybe three strawberries in the past few years so dog's going to bark in a second because the bins have just arrived um so use ground cover plants use uk native ground cover plants wherever you are in the world that's the idea yep so windbreaks we can use gelderose sea buckthorn um 
<laughs> there's loads of them. <laughs> Depends on the height. There's Willow, Bowles Hybrid, which is a uh, Salix, which is Vim, uh, a, a, a hybrid from Viminalis, Salix Viminalis. Um, oh, crikey, there's the, the, the mm, Green Alder, Altonus Viridis. Well, kind of close. It's, it's across in France, I think it is, but it's kind of close. But you get the idea. Use native plants for the bulking up, for the for the windbreaks, for mineral accumulators, for ground cover. Basically, for those plants, you're not getting a direct harvest from. Um, and then what you'll find as well is that quite a few plants will, you know, the native ones you can actually use. I mean, I've got a couple uh, hazels. Uh, case in point, there's a project up in. Um, Gina, Gina Bates up in up in Scotland. Where is she? East Lothian, East Loth, Loth, Lothian. And she has a vegan, uh, vegan organic uh, nut croft uh, up there, and she's growing hazels, uh, predominantly hazels, I think. I don't know if she's managed to grow any sweet chestnuts up there, but they're they're native. They're you kind of they're UK native, and I've got a couple more coming for coming here as well, and they do really well. So you kind of tend to end more with native plants that do well that need less maintenance. So, in terms of the ground cover plants, what I found is that um, there are quite a few. I think it's stopped raining, so let's let's get out there. There are quite a few ground cover plants that you can. There are quite a few um, ground cover plants that you can uh, use, uh, which are native, but they're not particularly well known about. Uh, and again, it really depends upon your conditions. If you look, I'll, I'll put this into the show notes. I haven't got official permission to use the the, the data in the forest garden spreadsheet. But it's uh, you can search for different conditions, different soil types, and different moisture levels. Uh, in this spreadsheet here, let me see. Shall I point up, and it will magically appear somewhere? There will be a flashing of a of a, of a URL for a spreadsheet. And in this sortable spreadsheet of forest garden plants, you can search for different conditions and then choose the right ground cover for your specific conditions. So let's get let's get outside. I've got oh goodness me, I've got loads of spam. That's oh, I was going to say. Oh, what a lot of spam. What a lot of spam. Okay, I just had a quick check up. Hi, Chris. More spam, more spam, more spam. Hello. <laughs> I think that's a net. Oh, I can't remember if that's a net or not. Okay, so I'm going to go pop out. And I'm just going to talk about the other uh, ground cover plants. Now, <clears throat> buying UK natives... Luckily, there are an increasing number of uh, nurseries, UK native nurseries in um, in the UK. So the ones that I've used, and I'll show you in a second. What side? I just need to get all these zoomed up. The ones that I've used are Celtic wildflowers. They've only been going for a couple of years. Celtic wildflowers, um, British wildflower plants are the two kind of main ones. It's raining again. <laughs> British um, Celtic wildflowers, British wildflower plants, and I think plant life. I haven't bought anything from them yet, but um, there are places where you can get them. <clears throat> so let's don the hat because it is raining. Hopefully it's not so wet that I need to get my umbrella. I might do. Hi Dan, Borida, come on then. Okay, so. Oh, these are all the plants for the eco homes job, and it's it's kind of yeah, it's it's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's good fun. A um, whole load of uh, mostly mostly native, and there's some fruit bushes, just berries and uh, honey berry, and then we've got the trays here of the of the different plants. There's oregano. I'll go through these in a second. I just wanted to show you, you know, the. These are the plug plants that I bought from British Wildflower Plants. And then I've also bought some, this is actually for a different job, but I've also bought some um, nice, uh, nine centimetre pots uh, for different grasses. Uh, for That's for the, the patio garden job that I'm doing. Just gone a bit quiet. Quiet. Now, what I wanted to show you was in my, my boring old raised beds. But... Um, You've got two options when you're when you're when you've got growing a plant you have two options 
you can propagate your own own plants you can start off with half a to buy half a dozen and then propagate from them or you can buy them as plug plants now the advantage of um, growing your own is that it's way 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 cheaper I bought half a dozen this is uh, some fight in my barricum dwarf comfrey <clears throat> I bought half a dozen from a local nursery uh, Jenny at Moreland Cottage Parlance which unfortunately she's not she's not trading anymore um, and I've propagated them and now there are acres this is <laughs> you dig them up big fleshy roots you dig them up and you can take make root cuttings and I've just, that's exactly what I've done you can just see over here I put them in pots oh so to, to be able to distribute them this is a bit of a mess up here uh yep yeah. so yep yeah, that's that that's one way of doing it same with the rubus nepalensis nepalese raspberry uh beech strawberry fragaria chiloensis green strawberry fragaria vir viridis and you um yeah you can propagate them and you can see they're 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 doing really well um and this is periwinkle lesser periwinkle uh vinca minor so I would recommend if you've got the space to do it that's a really good way of doing it and then what you can do rather than having to propagate them individually or put them into pots i, I, I can tell great big roots you've got two different types of um, plant you have a spreading plant so like all the all the rubus will spread by runners uh, same for the periwinkle as well uh, and then you have the kind of plants that spread kind of by big these are big thick roots the country has big thick roots and this will actually send out roots and they kind of come out the shoots come out and then they, and they all start rooting so that slowly spreads kind of clumping spreading as opposed to spreading so you've got the kind of more clumping stuff and then the, the the kind of spreading ones like the strawberry the vinca and the, uh, the, the the raspberry and then you have um, another couple that I wanted to show you they don't look all that, but you get the, you get the idea. This is really neglected uh, pond, uh, which needs quite a bit of weeding. But um, you get the idea. This is and this has I haven't looked I haven't done anything with this. This is oregano, oregano vulgare, or otherwise known as marjoram. Is the is the uh, is a native, <clears throat> and yep, this this is actually a really really good ground cover. Much much better than 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 I, than, I, than I would have thought. And another one, which is not done so well, but I think the conditions aren't so good for it, is um, lemon balm. And again, I've really, really neglected all this. So this is a uh, lemon balm here, Melissa officinalis. And that's more of a clumping, clumping ground cover. So that needs a lot of work. And then the other, the other thing I wanted to show you now, when you are planting your ground cover, I'll just show you down here. I've got Glaucoma hederacea ground ivy. When you are planting your ground cover, it's actually a really nice idea to be able to mix and match your ground cover. So you haven't got all of one particular type because what happens is, as you can see from here, this is um, ground ivy and it's all died back. You've got, there's comfrey and there's rhubarb. There's like, a dozen rhubarb there's a gooseberry bush just around about here you can just see that um, and it's all kind of died back you've got some geranium coming in I'm not terribly sure which one it is I should I should check uh, and there's some creeping buttercup but it's um, yeah if you interplant so what I've done I've ordered some ground ivy as a plug plant uh, but I've also uh, I've got a couple of other ones as well so evergreen ones which will hopefully keep a bit more keep, keep a bit more cover during the during the winter when some of them die back that you have a mix and the other really good reason for having a mix is that it depends on different conditions so this is a kind of raspberry raspberry bed here um, <laughs> which is great it just kind of does it, it does look after itself but the it, it's got beech strawberry, green strawberry, and um, ground ivy. And in the sunnier parts, you can see here that the yeah you know, there's there's some ground ivy here, but there's it's mostly strawberry. And then when you go to the shadier parts, you get more you get more ground ivy, and they kind of they work 
they work well with each other. Yeah, I know you probably can't see that. So more ground ivy down here. So they kind of balance each other out in an area. So it's kind of nice to have a combination of ground cover plants. But um, this is fantastic. Now this is what, you know, it doesn't look all that, but this is brilliant because it is providing a really, really good cover. And then you've got my free range, free range raspberries doing their thing. So, yep, good combinations of ground cover. As part of the uh, oh, part of the thing that I want to do is is, um, is for the Forest Garden Photo Gallery. That's ForestGardenGallery.uk. I want to have combinate. I've starting to put together combinations, kind of polycultures of different plants. So that you know, you can say, oh, okay, we'll put these two together. Now, I've got my list of list of plants. Uh, I've got one, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. I've got twelve different ground cover plants going in on the Eco Homes project. And what I've done, luckily, I've chosen quite a few <laughs> plants that like moisture. <laughs> so I've got a Lismachia nemorum, which is a yellow pimpernel. And these are evergreen, and the, uh, the, my plan is, and I don't know how successful this will be, is to plant these in combination with the ground ivy. So that's a uh, there's a Lismachia. Oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's creeping Jenny, which is a which is a relative. Uh, low creeping perennial of damp, shady places, evergreen, um, which is fan bloody tastic. So that's that will work really well in certain situations on the site where it's shady and it's damp and believe me there are lots of places on the site where it's shady and damp um and then i've got a couple more now this is a bit optimistic this is potentilla sterilis which is barren strawberry uh, and that's for drier places and i was going to put that out the front might have to mix up some some gravel with the um at the, at the, with the soil at the, front, at the front of the garden in the full sun, it might be too damp for it. Oh, oh and this has done all right actually. Well, I think this has been indoors to be honest. This is this is ground ivy, which looks really really different to the one that, I, the one that I've got. And then uh, a shed load of oregano again, likes kind of freer draining soil and full sun. So I will be putting these in with some with some gravel. Um, so, but yellow pimpernel and barren strawberry are two of the new ones for me. Two, two new ones for me. So I'll be really interested to see how, to see how these kind of get on. <clears throat> um, is that a, oh yeah, this is more like my ground ivy. <laughs> and then I've got some. I, I'm presuming this is wild strawberry, Fragaria vesca. Yeah, uh, it says sunny, but I've actually had it. Oh, semi shade semi-shade so that should that should do well and i've got a kind of mix and that's a nice thing just try out different things and see what works well um and i'm looking for the other one which is uh a, a mint family lamia uh, where is it ah. uh -huh. that's that's ground ivy and oh, here we are yep yellow archangel uh, and I just this is a member of the mint family, so um, closely related to the dead nettles. Oh, this is more kind of this is higher. This is about 30, 40 centimeters, but should spread. So I've got this as kind of for the entrance. So that should be kind of interesting, really kind of interesting plants to have. And then I've also got a lot of uh, dwarf comfrey going in around the fruit trees. So in a bed underneath the fruit tree, and that that's like root cuttings and cuttings with leaves on and those are from half a dozen plants and I kind of divided them up and put them into pots well, me and my my little boy did that um, yeah so it's kind of really really exciting to have the risk this range you see and you're planting out about three three to four plants uh, per square meter so <laughs> These will, uh, yeah, they're not massively big, uh, but possibly more. I'd do like five, I think. But they will, uh, they should take, they should take hold. And then the other one, the final one, is a, a field mint, Mentha arvensis. I just wanted to show you to round off. I wanted to show you 
kind of another combination which is really really good which works really really well is uh mentha fit mint and oregano um and again it doesn't look all that i think this is the other side of the uh, other side of forest gardening is making it more ornamental but once you have your ground cover in place then you can put shrubs in this is the beauty of it is that you can then start to to play around with uh shrubs and uh, and and other, and other herbaceous perennials coming in so for example here it is a mess well in a kind of messy way but we have um oh christ what is this is this tennessee in Volcaro? this is uh golden buttons or is this oh i'm not terribly sure there's um there's there's two plants going on here there was uh this is sorry, this is gold this is uh, tansy and i think this is um oh the one the horses shouldn't eat the yellow one that you that that, that cinnabar moths go on you know what i mean oh for goodness sake it's it's everywhere ragwort rag rag ragwort ragwort yes so ragwort and tansy i think so they they're kind of self-seeding and they'll come up but this is the kind of thing you can have and then on the bank again yeah it is sorry it is a mess i haven't, I haven't, I haven't done anything with it but we have a this is amazing in the summer this is uh this is oregano i'll cut this back in the spring late spring uh and then this is dry south facing bank here and then in the very stony so free draining as a fennel here oregano oregano and then the mint and this is the mint and it's you know it's bloody brilliant um really looks after itself and is contained by the oregano on one side and then uh, there's some lawn here yeah so that kind of combination that mint in the in the damper area and the oregano in the dry area and they flower at different times i think the oregano flowers first and then there's loads and loads of bees and pollinators on it and flies and stuff and then the mint then the mint pollinates the uh, mint flowers afterwards so they're kind of really really good combination working together in a you know in the in the right place and then you can put um uh, you can put uh, other herbaceous perennials in amongst it and shrubs and there's a there's a rose up there on but you get the idea it's a base you, you think of the ground cover as a base layer get that established and then start to put other plants in right then that's me <laughs> ragwort yes angie thank you yeah yeah, yeah it was ragwort. so that's that's me done um i hope that's useful so if you want to if you've got a relatively small space then plug plants might uh, probably the way to go and keep an eye on them keep keep them weeded because they're going to be much obviously much smaller but they're much much cheaper plug plants are the I, I was paying i think you pay about 65 pence if you order over 100 per plant per plug plant and because i ordered so many we've gotten down to 42 pence per plug plant and then you're planting up for four or five per meter square meter is actually is a, a kind of reasonable way of doing it anyway um the, and then the alter, other alternative is to set up a propagation bed and propagate them yourself, uh, which is more work, but they're in the long run cheaper. I hope that's useful, and um, thank you for watching. I'll put this up on YouTube, and I'm going to hop over to Zoom chat, and I shall see you all in a little bit.